so maybe we should uh, just just go ahead and, and start. Um, I, I just firstly I want to say uh, thank you, Mike, for uh, for joining us. Um, and and today we'll be talking about the NHLBI Catalyze program that is a relatively new initiative and, and unique to the NHLBI. Uh, basically, it strives to anticipate the needs of supported projects and prevent projects from failing for non-technical reasons. Um, and I'm sure uh, you, you'll go into this, uh, but uh, you know, in addition to funding uh, projects supported by the NHLBI Catalyze, receive project management support, access to technical services and expertise, advisory services such as IP regulatory and commercialization. Uh, services, training opportunities, access to the best practices, and the opportunity to become a part of an innovation network. Um, and, and basically the program, uh, uh, the program itself uh, funds initiatives that support project development, including project definition, preclinical research and development from post discovery phase all the way up to phase one clinical readiness. Uh, and enabling technologies and transformative platforms that address heart, lung, blood, and sleep diseases and disorders. Um, and I am incredibly happy to introduce uh, Dr. Mike Pike, the scientific director of the NHLBI Catalyze program. And uh, I, I look forward to this webinar. Great. So please, Mike. So uh, thank you again here. for the invitation to present today. I can see from the attendees some of uh, some some colleagues and friends that I know from the SBI Small Business Program and actually some from the, the West Coast. So thanks for getting up early for this presentation. So as was just discussed, the NHLBI Catalyze Program is a new approach to early translational support from the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute. Um, so just a little bit of background. So the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute is one of the 27 institutes at the National Institute of Health. Um, it is arguably the third or fourth largest uh, institute with about $3 billion of funding each year. And about 89% of that goes out the door as extramural grants to support investigators at over 500 institutions across the US. Um, and really, you know, the NHLBI is the, you know, the goal is to provide global leadership for research, training, and education uh, to promote the prevention early diagnosis and treatment of heart, lung, blood, and sleep diseases. And as an asterisk, sleep is in there as well. Um, and so it is guided I'm as an institute by four- I free most of Thursday afternoon. Excuse me? Oh, sorry. So please meet yourself if you're uh, not presenting. Um, so the NHLBI is driven by four mission-driven goals uh, listed here, you know, understanding human biology, reduce human disease, develop workforce and resources, and advance translational research. And the Catalyze program supports the advancement of translational research by providing a bridge from basic research discoveries into those clinical trials, um, as well as a focus on you know, training a workforce that's competent and fluent in product development and entrepreneurship. So the perennial problems that we, all, that we see in the early translational space are listed here. You know, there's a lack of funding there, or a funding gap between basic research and those early stage technology development studies um, that are sometimes supported by uh, the SBI or small business program or other types of you know, cooperative agreements. A lack of knowledge from your, your average academic investigator about how to bring a discovery to market. So a focus, a pivot from hypothesis driven research to product development and project management. And of course the need to access techn technical and commercial experts that are really essential for you know, providing the guidance of these, these really cool technical scientific discoveries into a viable commercial, commercial product. And so the NHLBI has been piloting it and experimenting with early translational programs over the last 10 years to kind of address these three uh, key criteria or challenges that early investigators um, you know, face in, uh, in translating scientific discoveries. Um, but a lot of these programs over the last 10 years have been disease specific or technology focused, or indeed some of them have been geographically restricted um, in order for investigators to uh, participate in these programs. So roughly six years ago, leaders, the NHLBI leadership tasked a small group of, of staff to take a deep dive into the best practices of these pilot programs. At the time, there was, rough, there was roughly 15 of these programs um, up and running, um, as well as take a, a landscape analysis of other 
type of institutes at the NIH and more broadly across the federal government and large foundations to identify best practices and support for early translational research in the biomedical space. Um, and what they came up with was the criteria for the Catalyze program. So listed here, you know, comprehensive support for the investigator that includes not only funding, but training in product development entrepreneurship, professional services to get that perspective and guidance in the other areas that are required for developing a, a product. Um, and also to have, you know, on-demand technical and expert advice. Um, a framework across the entire heart, lung, blood, sleep space so that, you know, it was not only co coordinated across the different um, extramural divisions, but then across technology types. So to provide this, you know, broad framework to support all of these technologies in the heart, lung, and blood, sleep space. Um, and then as projects advance toward, you know, preclinical refinement, um, the flexibility to pivot the projects to, you know, mitigate risks, which may sound familiar to folks who are not in the government um, developing projects or products. The ability to terminate these preclinical projects if they're no longer um, commercially viable or they're, they're a technical, you know, roadblock that, you know, proves that they can no longer be commercially viable. Um, and then the ability to reallocate funds from these projects that maybe aren't as promising to more promising projects. Um, and, and, and along with this, the ability to hire experts as needed on demand. And, you know, from a, from a management perspective, the ability to try new approaches to support the investigators, new approaches to fund the investigators, and, and also the management of these, pro these programs. And so with that, we came up with the Catalyze program. Um, and on the, the left blue flags are kind of the, high, the highlights of the program. So, you know, this, this strategy on focused on, you know, a unique funding strategy to really leverage the investments the NHLBI is making to require not only matching funds from non-federal sources, but then also to use new types of funding mechanisms and authorities that I'll get into a little bit at the end to allow us to act more like, um, you know, direct investors versus a grant that has to be, you know, there's certain requirements on grants of how, how they have to be terminated or a contract. So this gives us a lot more flexibility to um, really um, experiment with, you know, funding these projects. A coordinated approach, which I'll get into in a little bit as well. So that there's many different on ramps or entry points to the program based on where your technology uh, development is. So if you have a really early stage technology or just a, a new scientific discovery, there's an on, there's a you know funding for that. If you have some preliminary data, there's funding for that. And you know, if you're further along and need some additional assistance to get to that FDA approval, we are building that funding uh, mechanism or, or opportunity uh, as we speak. At the project level, there's a focus on individual support. So we require you as the applicant to come in with project management and milestones uh, within your proposal. But then we've stood up a coordinating center to support you with, you know, access to experts in the earlier stages. And then as you advance toward those, those later stage preclinical refinement studies, we actually will partner with you and, and help, you know, carry some of the technical um, burden away with you. And then as I mentioned, you know, as a, at a, as a program, there's this focus on learning as we go along and pivoting to, you know, to adjust the, pro the program to address any challenges that we identify. So this is the pilot program, it's small by design. Um, and so we really wanna concentrate on the projects we, we fund and learn from the investigators, get feedback from the investigators and make the, the project or the program uh, better. And on the right um, is what we're trying to build is this, this network of in innovators, right? So access to key technical experts when you need them only, um, additional advisory services from the Catalyze Coordinating Center, uh, the special office at the NHLBI, as well as our volunteer mentor network that spans roughly 80 or so experts in, in product development in the heart, lung, and blood space. Um, a focus on entrepreneurial training and development, and then experimenting uh, for the first time at the NHLBI that I know of, of investigators learning from investigators. So developing a cohort-based training program so that our awardees can learn from each other and you know, um, really maximize their time in the program. And with all these, feeding into this really this goal of bridging the, the, the long and sometimes very challenging uh, space between scientific discovery to clinical trials. 
So here listed are the program components. And as we developed these, you know, we had three things in mind, you know, one, to drive the development of new potential therapies by supporting these early product de definition studies and safety testing. Um, a special funding focus on enabling technologies and, and platforms that, you know, in their current state may not, be, may not have been funded by the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute because they don't have a Heart, Lung, and Blood indication as of yet. But should they be developed as a platform technology, they could really open the field for the next generation of diagnostic tools or therapeutics. Um, and then advance promising projects through preclinical studies by providing access to funding resources and experts, as I mentioned. So we broke it, broke it down in these, these five or so bubbles here. On the left-hand side is the earlier stage. So from concept, this would be your basic R01 grant or, or equivalent, where you, you, know, you have some new scientific discovery you think could be a product or a new a therapy. So we have funding, um, grant funding mechanisms that I'll walk through for the product definition for therapeutics, biologics, and drugs. A second funding uh, stream for devices and diagnostics. And as I mentioned, a special funding focus on enabling technologies that may be outside the heart, lung, and blood space, but could really open the field. And then we're in the process of, you know, launching the, the next, the later stage funding, which will be the preclinical or CAT PC. Um, and then in late September, we fund, or sorry, early September, we funded the coordinating center, which I'll tell you a little bit about uh, as we go along. So this, the, the Catalyst program was launched as kind of a, a soft rollout last fall with the publication of these five funding opportunities or RFAs um, focused, as I mentioned, on either devices, therapeutics, or enabling technologies. Um, the next application deadline listed here is March 9th, 2021. I will be doing another webinar in early 2021 um, to go over these funding announcements as well. And the eligibility requirements at the bottom are that you have to be part of a U.S.-based academic institution, a nonprofit institution, or a U.S.-owned for-profit institution. This includes both small business and, and, as we say, other than small businesses. So it's 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 broad program open to all U.S.-based investigators that have uh, technologies in our these focused areas. So the first one I'll go over is the enabling technologies and transformative platforms. And this is really, in some ways, the really cool kind of, you know, think outside of the box type projects. And, you know, we've funded the first cohort and we're in the process of funding the next cohort, uh, the second cohort. Um, and so just to go over the grant mechanism. So, um, you know, all grant mechanisms have a code. So the basic research grant is an R01. And then, you know, SBI or STTR R40 series. So the R61, R33 series is what's been used here. And the focus on these, these mechanisms is for innovation, exploratory, and de development research. So these are really kind of like high risk, high reward type mechanisms that don't, that fit in between your basic research award and, and potentially like a, a, an SBIR type award. Um, the duration of this project, of these programs in, in this, this funding is two years with a budget of $300,000 of direct costs. And listed here, there's no special requirements. And I'll, I'll mention, you'll see in the next few slides, the other mechanisms have special requirements that you'll have to take into account should you be considering to apply. Um, and on the right are kind of some of the, the ideas that we're looking for. So this is a later stage uh, funding mechanism where we expect you to have some of the, to have the feasibility um, data and, and, and um, studies already out of the way. And the focus of this is to further refine those ideas into a viable platform technology. And so some of the examples that, that we've seen within this space are kind of drug discovery platforms for kind of the identification of molecules, um, in vitro, in vivo model, animal models to enable clinically relevant safety and efficacy, uh, some technologies such as materials and devices to deliver pharmaceuticals or cell-based therapies. So th there's some really some exciting stuff going on there. Um, and one of the first technologies we funded through this in our first cohort uh, relates to some new non-invasive clinically relevant diagnostics using um, biomarkers and some an AI approach. Um, none of which were heart, lung, and blood specific to focus, but um, they have an idea that should these, these platforms be developed, they can then address a heart, lung, and blood specific indication and disease state. So 
So the next um, focus is on the small molecules and biologics or the therapeutics. So for the next two, I'm going to be telling you about the, on the left-hand side is going to be the biphasic, which is a R61, R33 for early stage technologies that need a lot, that need some more, um, you know, validation and discovery. And on the right-hand side is for technologies that are further along and want to be, will be considered a direct to R33. So, you know, it's pivoting back to the right hand, to the left-hand side for the 023 identification and validation and preliminary product lead series identification. It's a mouthful. Um, this is up to three years of funding. So the way you can propose the, the, the work is either spend two years in the R61 or spend one year in the R61, identify milestones to transition to the R33, meet the requirements for the R33 progression, and then, you know, spend two years in the R33. And so overall, you, you know, it's three years of funding, but you can spend no more than 24 months or two years in either one of the uh, mechanisms. Direct costs of $350,000. And the special requirements listed below, I'll get into more detail in later slides, but we want you to have an accelerator partner and a non-federal matching funds to be able to transition from the R61 to R33. Um, and some of the R61 activities that are, we're seeing proposed are target identification and validation, um, screening assays development and high throughput screening, some in vitro candidate testing and characterization, characterization of disease epidemiology. Um, and then, you know, some of the milestones, for example, to progress to the R33 would be the identification of a compound series, for example. On the right-hand side, and for the R33 component of the 023, um, some of the activities being proposed are, you know, the lead generation or the synthesis of novel series of compounds, some in vitro and ex vivo studies and toxicity testing, and then some preliminary, you know, small model in vivo efficacy studies, PK toxicity of compounds in relevant models. Um, and then, you know, some milestones, which we'll get into again later, would be, you know, for the R33 piece would be successful in vivo or ex vivo studies, you know, some preliminary in vivo efficacy in, in relevant animal models, um, and the identity, the identity of uh, lead series compound and provisional or non-provisional patent applications. So, so again, there's an IP component I'll, I'll mention in more detail later on in the slides. So the final of the, the grant funded mechanisms is the product development series or is the device diagnostics and tool um, companion funding announcements. Again, there's a biphasic R61, R33 application or funding announcements, the 024, and kind of a direct to 33, 028. Um, the same requirements uh, apply as far as the biphasic uh, mechanism where you can spend two years in the R61 and then transition to an R33 for one year, or vice versa, spend one year in R61, and then identify your milestones to transition into R33. The budget is slightly smaller at $250,000 in direct costs per year. And again, for transition to the R33 or to apply for the R33, you need to have an accelerator partner and um, commitment of non-federal matching funds, um, which I'll get into in a few slides. Um, so just to get into, uh, you know, these are very, very uh, wordy titles, but very descriptive, I think. And just some of the activities that you might see for a device in the R61 would be to generate experimental prototype design. Um, again, characterize disease epidemiology to identify that need. And then survey, you know, cl clinical literature to characterize the current care of patients uh, and identify the unmet needs um, within the patient population. And the milestones, you know, from the R61 component for a device would be you know, to have that prototype experimental design tested and an identification and some focus on IP. Um, for the, maybe some, some examples for the tools or diagnostics for the R61 would be to, you know, generate experimental design, you know, understand the mechanism of action and again, survey and identify the unmet need. And, you know, the milestones again are, you know, to identify disease target identification experimental design to be te is tested 
and really ready to um, you know demonstrate that this this prototype design is ready for more um, thorough validation and testing for the R33. Um, and so just to move back to the you know some of the the pro the R33 activities would be you know to further prototype uh, the development and, and refine the, the 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 design based on user feedback for example. Um, and then you know some of the some of the milestones for the R33 component would be to potentially have you know some of those pre 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 meetings with the FDA to discuss what is the clear to clarify the the, um, the regulatory pathway for your device or diagnostic or tool. All right, so that was a brief overview of the um, five grant funding mechanisms that are currently available and the next as a reminder the next application deadline is March 9th 2021 and as I mentioned before um, I'll be giving you some contact information at the end so that you can sign up or, or be uh, notified when we schedule the the next um, uh, webinar where I'll have some program staff from the, the divisions within each of these uh, devices and therapeutics that can answer some questions some more pointed questions about the technologies um, so now I want to get in. So just as you know, as a as a way of summarizing, so both the the therapeutics, device, and diagnostics have two funding mechanisms available. So based on where your technology readiness is, and there's special requirements listed on the right for um, for all of these funding mechanisms that I'll get into. So project management, milestones and timelines, matching funds, as I mentioned, an accelerator partner for the R33 component. Um, a focus on IP and regulatory, and the NIH-wide um, push for rigor and reproducibility in any studies that we fund across the NIH. So I'll just walk you through um, these special requirements and then um, move on. Okay, so project management. So um, we've identified from many of our, of our pilot programs that project management is a key indicator of success for these early translational uh, research projects. And the project manager should not be the, the primary investigator. It should be someone not the PI. Um, and you know the focus is that each project is expected to use project milestone driven project management or industry style project management to flesh out the, the development aims so that it's, you know, you have a Gantt chart or something similar to identify the key steps in the process in identifying risk along the way and how you're going to mitigate the risk. And, um, you know, these, these project management components, you know, should be your best effort. And as I'll mention toward the end, you know, we have expert project managers at the coordinating center. So if you don't have a strong project manager or you don't have a strong project management in your kind of local ecosystem, um, we can support you in, in that, but you should, take your best stab at making project management or milestone driven um, proposals or approaches in your proposal. Um, but just an asterisk that the enabling technology and transformative platform does not require project management. Um, but again, if you have it in that, it's, it's also a bonus. So the next requirement to go along with the project management is the inclusion of milestones. Um, so they're required at the time of application. So if you're applying for the biphasic R61, R33 funding announcement, you should have two sets of milestones. Um, they should be quantifiable and very clear. And these are essential, especially for that biphasic mechanism of the milestones you plan to meet for the R60 component so that we as the catalyzed staff can identify that you've met your milestones and allow you to transition into that R33 uh, component of your, your project. So on the right are some of the, 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 the things that are listed in the funding announcement and what we expect. So they should be useful as a measure of progress toward the overall goal of the project. They have to be identified in the application and based on the comments of the peer reviewers. Um, and then on our own experts, project managers, we may negotiate those milestones with you prior to funding your award. And what we, we're starting to do in the notice of award is actually have a, a standardized template where we can identify the milestones in addition to the, the normal research aims that are, that are published in the, the notice of award. Um, and along with you know, negotiating with you for the milestones, we do provide some support where if we identify a milestone that may not be the most appropriate one, we can suggest the new one and work that into your, um, your performance plan. 
And at the bottom, I just want to reiterate that specific aims do not equal milestones. Um, and so be sure that you're, you're fleshing out the milestones to meet the specific aims, but they're not one and the same. Okay, matching funds. So we, we know that um, in this early translational space, there's a lot of investigators who have really cool science, but they have no idea if it could ever be a, a project or a commercial pro product. Um, and so we've identified from other pilot programs and indeed some of the small business programs that by getting some you know, industry validation through non-federal funding support, um, it really helps um, you know, narrow, narrow down the projects that we, and focus of these projects into something that's commercially viable. So for the R33 portion of all of the awards, that includes the biphasic mechanism, or if you're applying directly to the R33, there's a 25% match, cash match, for the for no, non-federal funds for our direct funds. So again, $350,000 for the therapeutics, quarter of that per year. Um, the devices diagnostic is 25% a, a of the $250,000 or whatever you propose per year for your um, direct costs. Um, and again, the enabling technologies and transformer platforms get a pass on this requirement as well. Um, but again, if you have some matching funds, that's always a benefit to in review and beyond. So some examples of matching funding sources are foundations. Some of the, the academic institutions have an investment arm or a small fund, seed fund that they can provide some of those funds with. Um, state and local government economic development funds, angel investors, VCs, or indeed, um, I haven't seen any yet, but indiv individual benefactors can also provide some of these funds. Um, these are expected to be a cash match. While we don't require any, um, we don't dictate how these funds are used, we expect to have, that you demonstrate that you have these, these cash match commitments at the time of, a, of, of application. Um, and in-kind contributions are, are strongly encouraged, but they do not fulfill this requirement. And again, um, just want to reiterate that the HL 20-022 does not have any matching requirements for those applications. All right, so as I, as I indicated in the beginning, we know that investigators have the challenge of understanding what it takes to take a scientific discovery to a commercially viable product. Um, and so we've identified the need for accelerator partners to kind of give them the, the, the other skills they will need or, or resources they will need to advance their technologies toward um, you know, FDA clearance, but then also into the commercial landscape. So we don't, um, so at the time of application for the R33 or time of transition from R61 to R33, you have to have identified uh, an accelerator partner who will be willing to work with you um, to, to help advance your technology toward market and provide some of those entrepreneurial training and support services that we know that um, accelerators can provide and have a unique place in, in the ecosystem to do that. Um, and again, you know, we, as we build out this, pro this program, we will be looking for ex biomedical accelerators to partner with us and to help support our, our projects and may be able to help you find one within your, your, your local resource or local um, area should you need one. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, there is a focus throughout the program on IP and regulatory. So we know that from the investor community that without IP, no one's going to want to invest in your technology because they can't make any money off of it. So from the very early stages of this program, we want to, you know, double down on our expectations that, you know, you are thinking about your IP strategy and your regulatory path um, as well. So um, for what we're looking for in the applications is that you have some indicate you have some understanding that either you you've spoke if you're an academic investigator you have been in conversation with your tech transfer office and they're aware that you're applying to this program and there's some discussion on how you might license or or even submit a, a provisional patent or uh, for your technologies um, if they're a later stage we ex you know we we expect and anticipate that there may already be a provisional patent already being submitted or other type of IP um, protection that is being developed. And likewise, um, for the regulatory component, 
while we don't expect you to have already spoken to the FDA about your technology, a lot of these are too early stage, there, there is an expectation that you take the time to understand, you know, what is your most likely regulatory pathway and that you're setting up your experiments to fulfill the expectations from the FDA once you start to think about submitting your, your package for them to review. And as I mentioned, you know, as we have experts within our coordinating center and indeed within NHLBI that can help help you understand the, the, the regulatory strategy or pathway. And then as we invest more in you in the Catalyze program and get, you know, in the later stage, preclinical refinement components, we'll be taking, the Catalyze coordinating center will be taking a more active role in that regulatory um, component of your, of your technologies. And again, like all the reoccurring theme, the enabling technologies and transformative platforms does not require uh, a regulatory uh, or IP consideration. And again, kind of a, a push from the NIH wide is to ensure that there's rigor and reproducibility in any studies that you propose. Um, and for more information, please follow this link and be sure that you're following the guidelines provided. Um, and in general, it's just to ensure that the principles of the study design and transparency are essential and that it's clearly defined what you're doing and how you're doing it. All right, so just to summarize, again, you know, there's two different funding streams for both therapeutics and devices and diagnostics, the biphasic R61, R33 for early stage technologies and a direct R33 for technologies that have some preliminary data and meet the minimum requirements for matching funds and accelerator partnership prior to applying. And across the whole program, with the exception of um, you know, we want some, we want a focus on project management, uh, milestones and timelines, focus on IP and regulatory uh, strategy and, and indeed rigor and reproducibility. Um, so next I wanna transition a little bit. So just here's where we are back at our map of, of the program. And I wanna tell you a little bit about the coordinating center since we funded it um, and some of, the, tool, some of the, the really cool characteristics that they're providing to, to the program. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll end with a little bit of a discussion on the preclinical uh, piece before questions. So just to focus the program, so in red on the right are the federal NHLBI support um, entities. So the Catalyze program as a, a, as a small staff, we are a trans NHLBI um, a program. So we sit at the office of the director and you know, work with the extramural divisions, the extramural divisions being the division of cardiovascular science, the division of lung disease, and the division of blood researches, re, blood, blood researches, blood research and disorders. That's, that's always a mouthful. So for any given uh, project that is funded, there will be some interaction with um, me and the Catalyze program group. You'll have a, uh, an assigned program officer from the, um, from each of the, from one of the three divisions, depending on where, where your technology fits within heart, lung, or blood, or sleep. And then on the left-hand side, this whole program is being supported and really run um, by RTI and UNC Chapel Hill, where they're providing a lot of um, their expertise in you know, program management. Um, they have project managers and product development experts at RTI or access to them. They have a you know, communication arm and on the left-hand side, they're going to be um, developing the preclinical uh, funding announcement and award system, as well as reporting and, and program evaluation. Um, and down at the bottom is where we're still trying to experiment about the training and educational programs that we're going to provide through the, through the, the Catalyze program. And just to give a kind of snapshot of what RTI is bringing to the table. So they are an amazing partner and really not an awardee more so than just a partner. So they, they have a lot of experts and we just finished the kickoff meetings for the first cohort of the grant funded product definition of, of funding announcements that I just went through. And so um, each of the first awardees um, sat down with a team of experts from RTI, you know, numbering in I think the, you know, nine to 10 different individuals that have expertise in either product development support, you know, listed here, therapeutics, engineering, or regulatory affairs, 
they have a, a special commercialization arm at RTI to help with landscape analysis and you know helping to understand how your technology will fit into the market landscape. And then UNC Chapel Hill um, is has expertise in, in skills development and also is part of the CTSA. So they have that link to the clinical trial network and all the training programs. And so the idea is to have this continuum from you know the catalyzed program to then feed in potentially to the, the CTSA network. And on the right are, are some of the activities and skills that they're bringing along to each specific project. Um, on the left hand side are the product definition or the grant funded awards. And on the left, the right hand side of the wheel is what they'll be providing to the preclinical um, awards once they're funded. So all in all, it's really impressive the amount of support that these um, investigators are getting. And, and some have actually been quite surprised that uh, we're taking such a hands on approach to these projects. All right, so last I want to just um, touch upon in broad terms because nothing is in writing yet on the preclinical piece that we plan to launch in hopefully late spring of 2021. It will be the last piece of the, of the Catalyze program um, to one support projects that are successful in meeting the product definition R33 um, aims and milestones, but then also for later stage projects that have been funded through, you know, either other um, NHLBI awards in the past, or certainly the small business program, or if you if an investigators have developed these kind of new technologies that are appropriate for the heart, lung, and blood space, but haven't been funded previously. So this will be a, a catch-all for those later stage preclinical projects. Um, so just at, at a high level, you know, this the focus of this funding stream will be, you know, to support end stage proof of concept through preclinical development for U.S. Uh, regulatory approval. So no clinical trials are allowed within this program, but we will get you all the way to the FDA's door, um, help you with the conversation, and then you know hand you off to one of our clinical trial programs, hopefully. Um, and it really fills this gap between you know the product definition, grant-funded um, projects or programs, and the regulatory approval steps. Um, it's going to be across the heart, lung, and blood sleep space, and include or be open to small molecules, biologics, and devices. Um, and it's really going to be um, a collaborative process between the Catalyze program RTI and the applicant, where we'll most likely have some sort of pre-submission or pre-application, and then an invitation to provide a full application. Um, and this is being done through the Catalyze Coordinating Center outside of the the, the normal um, NIH Center for Scientific Review. Um, and with that, we have a lot more flexibility with you know working on the application or giving feedback to the applicants as far as milestones and aims that maybe aren't quite where they need to be and allow them to um, address those concerns before we fund them. And this is all being, all this flexibility is because we're using a, a unique funding authority that the NHLBI has called Other Transaction Authority, um, which allows the, the Institute to kind of fund these projects um, not through grants or contracts, but other, as the name implies. And so these are direct funds that can be, in, you know, awarded to the to the investigator um, with some with a lot more flexibility for these these high risk, high reward type of projects. Um, so again, this is a very new program. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to um, to speak to you all today. Uh, so right now at the top. On the left, you know, the Catalyze FAQ page, this is an NHLBI supported website where we have listed the funding announcements I went through as well as some FAQs. Um, in addition, you know, you can go to the grant funding page and, and dig through the RFAs yourself to understand the requirements and descriptions. Um, we are soon to launch the Catalyze coordinating website, which will be nhlbicatalyze.org. Don't go there today, it's not up, I just checked. Um, but we hope to have that up in the next week or two um, with additional information and supports and, and, and tools for you to um, to work through. And if you have any questions or want to know more about the program or schedule a meeting, the email is listed here, nhlbi underscore catalyze at nih.gov. Um, so in addition to the Catalyze program, there are several other translational programs at the NHLBI. And there's a special innovation office called the Office of Translational Alliance of Coordination that runs um, or supports a lot of these programs. And indeed, they'll be supporting part of the Catalyze program. And they also manage the SBIR and SCTR program. 
So if you want more information, that's hyperlinked to their webpage. And Dr. Kathleen Roche will be speaking at the next uh, um, non dilutive funding conference in January, I believe. Um, so be sure to tune into that if you want to know more about the services they provide um, in, to, to complement and support all of these programs. So that's all I have as far as slides. I'm happy to uh, pause here and take any questions. I see I'll, I'll add it. And I, I, again, thank you for your time today. Wonderful. So um, firstly, uh, I'll say, uh, you know, thank you so much, Mike. And, and until the Catalyze website is up, um, we'll definitely send out the slides. So, uh, so uh, everyone participating uh, could have some, some more information. Um, and, and Mike, I think you can open the, the Q&A box and you can see that you actually um, received a question. Yes. Can you sure. see that? Sure, so I'll read it out loud. So it, it's um, basically asking, do you see any venue for EU-based profit small companies to, to benefit from the Catalyze program? Um, so right now, the, the answer is it's not open to, it's only open to US-based uh, nonprofit academic and for-profit institutions. There are some provisions made for US based or US owned subsidiaries that may be um, outside the US who may be able to apply and be eligible. Um, but what we're really trying to do is get this pilot program up and running. Um, but because we have this flexibility of how we're funding it, we do have the opportunity to potentially in the future to partner with someone in the EU who would be able to support those programs and use our best practices and frameworks. And um, so I guess to confirm right now, you have to be US based uh, to be eligible for this program. Perfect. Um, so, so let, let me suggest uh, we part now. Um, oh, and there is actually another question before we. Um, so, we end J Labs the you see qualify it? as an accelerator partner. They do indeed qualify as an accelerator partner. Good. Okay. So, so thank you all. And of course, if you have any additional questions, feel free to either email one of us or um, Mike, uh, hopefully. Um, and, and thank you all for your time. Uh, we'll definitely send out an email with the recording of the webinar and the slides. <clears throat> um, and Mike, do you want to answer the last one before we, uh, we sure. log so off? We've only funded one cohort, um, so it's really hard to give success rates per se. Um, I can tell you that it's fairly com competitive, and we're getting a lot of um, applicants who are not discussed or not even allowed to um, go to the review because they're not meeting the administrative requirements. Um, so the first two rounds were, were, you know, funded without a catalyzed coordinating center or actually, you know, I was hired you know, late spring, so um, even after the first two deadlines. So I think we'll do a better job of educating the investigators on what information is required to apply and make their, their applications more competitive. Um, but we don't have, I don't have any success rates right now uh, available. Perfect, good. Okay, so, so thank you all for your time. And uh, please uh, free, feel free to, to join us next time. Bye and have a great day. Keep safe. Thank you. Bye. Bye.